Welcome back, everybody, to the uh, Film Production Podcast. Uh, this week, we're talking about production design, uh, which is something we've not covered yet, so this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, we are joined today by uh, Abby from the University of Salford, uh, Jane, also from the University of Salford, and Neil, who works at the Royal Exchange Theatre as in, uh, in props, a head of, head of props? What is it exactly that you, you do? Um, head of props and settings, so we build the scenery and the props. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you guys want to do like a quick background about where you're going, where you've come from. Um, I don't know who you want to start with. We can start with you, Neil, if you like. Uh, yeah, then. I've been to the garage and I'm back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, started at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. Um, I'd never really been in theatre in, in, in uh, my early years. And uh, I suddenly found this world of uh, creative people where I could... Uh, earn a living uh, for messing about for the rest of my life. <laughs> so here I am. Um, yeah, and it's been very enjoyable so far. Uh, and then obviously I moved to the Royal Exchange after that, um, did various jobs. I was scene painter, first of all, head scene painter, prop maker, head prop maker, and now I'm uh, props and scenery and whatever else you care to throw at us <laughs> awesome yeah yeah it's it the with obviously we're obviously a film course but i know there's a lot of very transferable stuff between theater and film and we're going to talk about that today a little bit sure, as yeah. well yeah um so we've also got uh we'll do abby next hello right uh so my name is abby rios as you already stated um well, I'm a film production student and, being, and I've been in production design or well interested in it since like four or five years ago now. Wow, time flies. Um, yeah, so my first small project was like something that I wrote and directed, you know, the drill. Um, it, was, it was really nice and I just like completely fell in love with like all the colors and like just building stuff and putting it in places and like that meaning something and that like just like importing something to the to the film and then uh, my most recent project was man at arms uh with james knowles that recently won uh an award from uni the business and the enterprise award wasn't it, it was yeah that's it yeah. Yeah. Enterprise awards. yeah yeah so he was the producer in that one and i was a uh, production design we had an amazing time like it was the dream team uh it was hard really really hard uh we got to film in a quarry at night at like ungodly hours <laughs> with a tank but it that, was amazing I, throw that in there. I don't think people should be forgetting that you actually had a tank on set so that's um yeah don't, don't <laughs> all stuff going on on that film <laughs> yeah it was loads loads of things uh that we need to be prepared for and like at the end of the day it was like everyone giving a hand in everything uh but yeah but mainly i did production design <laughs> um yeah i got an internship at barrow creative which is like a small I, I would say small but i don't think they're small at all uh workshop in salford and they make like uh scenery and props and like stuff for for enterprises and like events so i was really excited about that until the covid came along and now now we're here. <laughs> awesome, nice. Yeah. yeah. You see it has put a stop to a lot of things. Um yeah. yeah, which is a shame. But I'm sure you still have those opportunities because you've still got a lot of cool things that you've done that you can, you know, throw at people in the future. <laughs> this is over. Um and we've also got Jane here today. So I don't know if you wanted to give you a little story. Um, yeah, fine. Um so I'm currently I teach um film production. I'm lecturing in film production at the University of Salford. Um so I lecture in script writing and production design um, primarily. I think that's because in terms of production design, I just think it's really important for helping communicate the story with film being you know, visual medium. Um, I'm really interested in how we take it from the script onto the screen and provide context. And I suppose what I'm hoping to achieve over the next five few years is um, help students actually do that um, and help them understand and learn how they need to be communicating context and character and helping the audience 
believe in that world. So that love that type of visual communication is what I'm really interested in um, and what I'm looking at um, currently. Yeah. So ha Neil, have you actually done any work on any like filmed camera productions at all within in terms of props and uh... um, yes. Over the years, I've done um, uh, various things. I've done individual props, just sort of made and sent off. Um, but I've actually worked as construction manager on um, a BBC drama called Faith. Um, that's the first time I met Maxine Peak actually, on that. Um, and uh, Solo Shuttle, which was a Channel 4 sort of film. Uh, then another film, Warp Films in Sheffield, um, Hush it was called, and I was sort of props master on that. Did various gruesome uh, props. If you've seen the film, it's a bit of a horror film sort of thing. Yeah. What, what do you find like are the main differences that you get between having something on film or is there a, a sort of a design choice you go through that ch di like differs? I don't think there's much difference because I know a lot of theatre designers that do film. Um, Mike Britton, his friend, he, he's just done that thing with Tom Hardy, which was brilliant. Um, Taboo, if you saw it, he designed a set and costumes for that. So I think theatre designers are um, slightly different. They concentrate more on the on the real sort of setting a scene each each scene I don't know how and and for me it kind of works when when they do transfer um Christopher Oram is another one that I think has done that various you know so it's all transferable yeah yeah um I don't know if if Jane you have any thoughts on like this sort of like the difference between camera and and sort of t like a theater or sort of that sort of world of like creating a set and like creating the mood and stuff well I think it's I completely agree with Neil that it is a skill set that's completely transferable I think between between the two mm. worlds because essentially it's all about storytelling isn't it ultimately what we're trying to achieve is to immerse an audience in this world and these people's lives that we're either watching in the theatre or we're watching on screen and what we're seeking to do through the set, through the props, through, you know, even colour aesthetic or design, you know, like that more overarching um, sort of idea is to help the audience believe in that world, accept that world and, you know, be taken along with those characters on their journey. So I think fundamentally that that's what we're looking to do. And if we're looking at like absolute fabrication, like getting more into sort of the actual practical application of making the things that we need. Again, there's sort of a certain quality that needs to be put into those so that mm. they they don't have to be exactly perfect all of the time. I don't think sometimes I think we get away with stuff a little bit. Audiences can be a bit forgiving <laughs> um, as long as we create the right atmosphere and the right representation. Um, but that sort of production value um, and making sure that we're doing it to the the best quality that, that we possibly can. But it always comes back to that story um, and that representation of that. I will say, Neil, actually, I was looking at um, the punk rock, different mm, yeah. production punk rock that you were working on. I found oh, it really yeah. interesting. Yeah, the, the way that you had to change the sets from mm -hmm. the lyric theatre to come to the exchange and the way you had to interpret those worlds differently and represent them different yeah. I thought that was interesting it's a different uh yeah I mean I'm I'm used to uh because I've really only worked specifically at the crucible where it's an, a, a sort of thrust stage and the, what so basically you can have an audience member sat right next to something you've made um and and the same at the Royal Exchange uh you're right next to the the scenery as it were so everything has to be as detailed as film work, in my opinion, on those mm -hmm. particular stages. Whereas if you have a Pristini March stage, which is like the lyric, we didn't cut any corners, but you can cut corners because the audience just don't don't get a close up 
view of things. So like you're saying, and the same applies with a long shot in film, you could just put a bit of plywood up with a painted brickwork on and for all intents, when you see it in the long shot, you, you nobody would know. Just to cover up a satellite dish or a telephone box, we've done that in the past where you, you have to make a street look clean, as it were, and get rid of the modern stuff. I'm um, sure you know all about that. And, and <laughs> shop frontages in particular, just putting a plywood board up with yeah. uh, old fashioned looking. Um, I mean, you can literally use black tack, can't you? And just put the sign up and take it down once you've once you've done the yeah. done the shop. So yeah, it's all a bit um, mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> with with stuff like this, yeah, this and Abby can also sort of jump in on this one as well. But like. One of the questions we were sort of thinking about was, you know, how can students really be saving money when they're making these props and how can they get, how do they know what, where to go, like how far to go? Like, what's the best way to well, sort of like tackle something like this? I think if I, if I can answer that, uh, I think it all comes to like logistics because, right, so when I ever like start drafting my prop list or my vehicle list or like I try to get like everything, um, I start by making a list of things that I can have, like I would normally have on my house. So I start like asking people, like as a student, that works because we don't have much like to work with. So if someone has it, I prefer like borrowing it, borrowing it and alterating it than actually buying something new. Or uh, as he said, like you can just like make things look different just by like pasting something on it or like painting it different or just like changing the position of it so it's more about like thinking what you have and like what you can work with and then asking yourself is that necessary does that tell me actually something on the film or can I replace it with something else that I already have uh, at least that's what works in short film uh, <laughs> in student short films uh, I don't I think, think that works life. in theater though <laughs> i think that's life in general when you make <laughs> if you can get it for free that's yeah the best. if you can borrow it great <laughs> yeah i totally agree with that that um we generically we often like call it kit bashing or whatever um you know just taking what you've got and adjusting it and amending it and altering it and trying to create something new out of this old piece of furniture or whatever you have yeah. to make it fit the atmosphere of that scene or that room whether it's a table or a chair whatever it might be and just trying to tweak it and alter it so it fits um yeah. You know, we always say this, don't we, like on a student production in particular, but extending into sort of, you know, the art struggle at times. Um, and we're often working on very low or no budget productions, even when we yeah. start our careers or even established. We might have a passion project that we're working on with people and there's not a great deal of funding behind it, but we really want it to be made. <laughs> so, you know, we and I don't know how you feel about this, Neil, but sometimes I find particularly in low budget films that are shot on location quite a lot that's that's where the budget tends to get slashed quite yeah. <laughs> quite yeah. heavily you know can you not yeah. just find something you know? yeah well basically I remember on that uh on Faith in particular we were in a, a a sort of disused um coal mine it was about the miners strike um and yeah we were just going around all the rooms that were there and just finding furniture on site rather than going out looking if we could that's what we do. Um, so yeah, it's just being resourceful, isn't it? On the yeah, job. definitely. And using your charm to uh, <laughs> to to get things. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you ever use like certain pieces of uh, furniture, like uh, some set things? Because like I I do. Like if I have something that I can use for other films, and I can just like tweak it a little so it doesn't look exactly the same. Like definitely. I just do it to save. Uh, money and time you know but I don't know if in theory you can get away with that because people might recognize it I've got a particular dead rabbit that's been in at least two or three shows uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm trying to think there's all sorts of bits that we've like furniture that's been adapted changed mm -hmm. for, for the next one um, it probably would clash if you if you saw something in 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 like production a in january and then it changed to production b in february and there's the same table 
I think you have to give it a little bit of time if you're using, uh, you know, the same yeah. exact same thing. And also, the designer will have input and say, "Oh, yeah, that's great," or and they might not have seen production A, and we'd have to tell them then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we do. <laughs> so does the um I assume I mean I assume, I assume this is the case, but does the Royal Exchange have like a, a, a specific like props room that you have all the stuff for every performance, or does some of these get moved to other theatres, or sort of what happens? Well, um, at the end of a production, if there's anything that we can um, potentially reuse, uh, small props or things that are intricate that we've made that we think might use again, i.e., a dead rabbit. Um, uh, we would keep them because they're small and manageable and food is one that we tend to you know keep it's useful you know if you make some fake food we just have a, a stash of that now um, and you know uh, cups and sauces all that sort of thing yes we have a store at the workshop below in the basement um, and then we also have another store which is for larger pieces of furniture and maybe like ranges, fires that we've made, some that we've are originals, some uh, props, you know. And so we have that facility, yes, which is very useful. Um, and another, you know, people come and, and borrow things from us too. We're not, uh, you know, we will lend to people um, <clears throat> around Manchester and, and beyond. Um, they're quite. Uh, happy to well i wouldn't say happy but they will uh lend things because it is is a job in itself when you're lending things out you have to monitor it when it's coming back and all that so we don't have someone designated for that so we aren't really a prop hire company but we will help students like yourself out and uh and that sort of thing Oh, great. That's that's something that I'm sure people will be uh, taking you up on as an offer. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You'll get a million emails. <laughs> it's not my department. <laughs> Think about those low budget options. People yeah. do generally go to charity shops, but I don't know if you've heard of like the tip shops and stuff as well for student productions in particular. They're so cheap. A lot of the stuff you can yeah. get in there, um, you know, and it's amazing what people take along and end up in those little like tip shops and stuff even like bigger furniture pieces and stuff that you might need or like you're saying about signs yeah, yeah. The, the randomness of stuff that you find in those places <laughs> um yeah. you know it's amazing what people throw away sometimes and the free cycle sites that you've got now that we never used to remember when I was a student um it's probably should, you don't go into skips and take things out of skips like you shouldn't be doing that as uh, students but you don't have to anymore that's what we used to do we'd like see something sticking out and we'd be like we need that so we're gonna yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> we ended up so let's not encourage that but mm. you've got the recycle sites and stuff now so like you can go on to facebook or whatever and it's people just saying if you come and collect this from my house you can have yeah. it yeah so mm -hmm. it's just thinking a little bit more down those roads as well and just going right it's not perfect i think you're never going to find the perfect object potentially you know unless you're looking at spending quite a lot of money or commissioning yeah. someone like you for example to actually make it for you you know yeah like to go along and this is what i need <laughs> and it has to look like this drawing that i have here and because <laughs> i'm yeah. not good at this like <laughs> you know it's unusual that you'd walk into a shop and find that thing so yeah you know it, it's looking at you which elements that you can get and where you can get those from I'd say maybe and mm. the same locations the amount of times I hear people saying oh but I can't find the exact location I want to shoot this set it, this scene it's it's not exactly how I imagine it in my head it's like well it's very unlikely you're going to find that so yeah. you need to find a space that you can manipulate and alter and create what you Absolutely. see. Okay. Mm. Yeah, exactly. making a film that starts sense. with just giving up all your ideas. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I have this idea. I know it's not going to happen exactly that way. If you're OK with it, you can make a film. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's that collaboration with other people, isn't it? You might, as a designer for that film, have done all these sketches and concept art and the drawings. Mm -hmm. Then you need to speak to other people that are great at making props that can actually build and design sets and be like, this is what I'd like, but what's actually feasible? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Mm, awesome. Yeah. So uh, do you guys want to have like a quick, I don't know if you want to tell us about any particular times that you've uh, made certain props or done things in a certain way, like very more specifically, because um, I know you said, oh, yeah, there's this, that and the other. And obviously the dead rabbit story is a is a <laughs> nice one. <laughs> um, but yeah, if there's some like ones you want to throw out there uh, about production design that you have in particular. Um, um, would be interesting. Yeah. I mean, every every show has its has its own little challenges um, with prop making. Um, so there's, I mean, there's various props that I've made over the years that that have have sort of been uh, difficult. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, loads, <laughs> but we've sort of managed to get through most things. Um, I can't think of anything that's ever stumped us completely. Um, I mean, we've done, we've electrified cars, we've, you know, made and run uh, on batteries like a forklift truck. We've, um, trying to think, made things spin round quite often, uh, <laughs> which is always a challenge. Yeah, water, yeah, Gillian's just reminded me. Water, rain, you know, that's getting quite technical now. We've got one uh, member of staff, Andy Bubble, who's uh, particularly gets involved in uh, his water jets, and to the point where people ask him from other theatres um, if he can, you know, get involved with their productions. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of a, a bit of a severed head specialist, I suppose, and dead thing, <laughs> um, which is not. A great claim to fame, but I've made lots of dead animals uh, and a dead uh, little bird for one show where we put a piece of pasta in its neck so that it could have its head chopped off each night, which was nice. A nice little crunch there, so that's the top tip. <laughs> and also putting uh, little files of uh, blood into severed heads where the actor can just flip the top off so that it, it bleeds it doesn't start bleeding until he makes it bleed kind of thing so um, yeah those are the things i kind of enjoy as well weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a technical thing you're doing as well really you know trying to make things happen in certain ways and like like you said with the blood thing as well if you're going to be doing that there's yeah. a, sort of, a certain level of te tech that's involved in that or is it all very much like practical sort of or is it electronics as well or also it's i mean we have a department where certain people are sort of specialists in that field like Andy I mentioned he's really good at uh, working things out in terms of uh, electronics and sort of levers and pulleys and things like that and we have another guy called Carl um, who's particularly good at metalwork welding and solving problems that way Ben who's a bit of an old rounder he can do what I do, what Carl does a little bit, Stuart who's a joiner, and then we have scenic painters, Phil and Kat, who do just just that, but they do get involved in, in other bits as well. And then there's Sarah, who is um, kind of like a specialist in soft props and puppets and things like that. So we've got all bases covered. I'm more of a sculptor type person. If there was a job like that, that would be me handling it usually. Um, although we did have a number, another member of staff who used to be aligned with me, uh, Steve, he's gone now though. So um, yeah, so that's that's what we do. We kind of like come together on certain things. If there's a big floor to do, we'll all join in uh, most of the time. And then everybody has their own little specialist. So we got all bases covered really. It's quite good. Yes. If we all back there. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, nice team that you got sort of built as well with that just fall within the theatre, I suppose, as well. So you can have, like you say, have all the bases covered. Yeah, um, mm. quite experienced as well because, you know, Phil's been at the Royal Exchange a long time, 20 years, I think, maybe more. <clears throat> so, you know, everyone's quite capable and experienced. Mm. Nothing phases us really these days. <laughs> Excellent. That's what you want, really. Um, do you, Abby and Jane, is there anything you want to pitch in with, like, um, in terms of, you know, stories that you've had from your prop making or production design elements? Um, 
I'd say, well, there's that. And I was just to link into what Neil was saying, like that level of collaboration, I think is really important. And just recognising that you can't do everything all of the time and that you may have very specific skills and really excel in a certain area, but you need to work with other people that have other skills and excel in other areas and not to be afraid to get more people involved um, and build that yeah. network of people. I think particularly for students um, at the moment that are sort of working their way in and trying to make these films, I think often you, we can fall into the trap of going, well, I'm the production designer, so I need to find the locations, I need to make every prop, I need to, you know, it's like you don't have to, do, one, it's impossible, and you're not going to be able to do all of it because you may not have the skill set. Um, so find those other people. I mean, you know, even within the university, there's, you know, other courses that do specialise. So we've got costume specialist students, we've got set theatre stage and TV design students that specialise and um, we've got art students like fine art students that are really good with sculpture and creating these things and um, so I'd say it's getting to know those people and building networks and getting to know professionals like Neil that you know can point you in the direction and you know maybe point out that you know, that's quite a big technical thing that you're trying to achieve there um so you're probably going to need some help with that <laughs> you know um so you know again coming back to that idea of feasibility i suppose i think that's what i see quite a lot happening quite a lot that one person gets given all of this responsibility in the role of just titled production designer forgetting yeah, yeah. that actually an art department production design is one part of an art department mm -hmm. and that's a lot of people in that art department that are all very specialist and very good at their individual roles so it's remembering that and disseminating that work I suppose would be my yeah. kind of thought on that really yeah it's just like remembering yeah you cannot do everything and there's people who is going to do like a great job is if you just like let go of that part it's just uh, like it, like right designing the film is just like half, it's not even like half of it not even half of it like making all the research and then getting pretty drawings and mood boards that's just like the easy part in com <laughs> like in comparison which w like with everything that is uh, need to be made um yeah like I need you need painters you need like uh people that make sculptures, you need uh, people that know how to sew like a dress or something. Uh, I was I was so proud because I made a, a small bunny toy for the film that I just worked in. And I was so proud of it because like, I used like the sewing machine at uni and I like, I, I, I used a tutorial for like, from like YouTube. And I was like, oh, I, I did this, you know, like and now I can like do soft props now. Nah. No, that's not that's not it. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not like that. It's good that you have the skill sets to like get along in a student film. You know, when it's required that you can do everything. But if you can just like, you know, find support in other people that actually do it, it's going to be ten times better. Like you, you just need like to actually source people out. Like when you have a, a team already, uh, like Neil, like that's amazing. You know, when you're part of a team and you have like a task and everyone is like working towards the same like thing that you need to do, it's, it's just like so good. Like it feels so great to be part of the team, which like we as students like don't get much because <laughs> we have really low budget. So we think that because we have low budget, we cannot get other people involved. And that's not true. Like people still want to participate in like in all this uh, projects and like making stuff because we like it. I mean, we go to uni to do this because we like it, you know, it, it, there's a reason. So if you like can get people involved, it's going to make your life so much easier. So, so much easier. <laughs> yeah, we're not in theatre for the money, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I mention Stuart, by the way, it'll kill me if I uh, if I didn't, uh, Stuart is the man we'd go to if we wanted like a, a nice cabinet making with drawers that work and, you know, he's the man for that. So he's a joiner type. So we've got, yeah, all those people and it's great. I inherited that, that team, basically. The only 
two that that came with me, I suppose, are um, the newest member of staff, who's now leaving us. Um, mm. <laughs> it's all my fault. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was I was very thankful to inherit such an experienced team because it's hard to build a team like that. <clears throat> mm. And yes. trust people, and we're always learning. Having said, we, nothing phases us. We are always learning because yeah. you know, there's things out there that we don't know about that we get involved in, and then suddenly you might have to ask a specialist, like you say. Um, and so we're we're the, we're the same, really. Um, mm. Always learning. I'd imagine Neil, like, is there quite a lot of sort of prototyping and figuring stuff out for some of the yeah. parts of the building? Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, time is the issue mostly, yeah. and if if that's obvious, I will highlight it in 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 my budgeting of the time and and uh, cost for the show. I will say this is not straightforward. It needs some research and development. We need time for that allowed. Uh, yeah. How like how much time do you uh, usually get? Uh, like in advance, like how much time before do they tell you, oh, we're going to make like this production, we need to start like researching about it. It's, it's quite good at the Royal Exchange, or it, it was. Um, <laughs> it seems like a while ago, but you, you we have a, a good advance meeting um, f for like a white card meeting, just getting ideas out there and then if something's glaringly obviously going to be over budget, the production manager will sort of come to us and say, this is going to cost a lot, isn't it? And we might have to change things at that stage. Then it gets to the next meeting. And then the, the last meeting, we should, we should know exactly what we're building. <laughs> um, and most of the time we do. But quite often, there's still uh, <laughs> talks going on, shall we say. Right. Uh, I have a question. Does your, I, I will say, like team or department uh, work strictly for the theatrical productions, or do you have also like you're sharing ballet and like opera as uh, well? Only we tend to look after the the Royal Exchange because the resource is the Royal Exchange, but mm. we have in the past built um, scenery for home and um uh the the music college um and people take on individual uh freelance jobs yeah like i was saying specific props that might they might do in the evening or weekends and just you know for some extra money um to make up the very poor wages yeah <laughs> <laughs> extra freelancing <laughs> What's a good way for um, students to sort of get their foot in the door with, you know, with a company uh, like the Royal Exchange or any any anything prop related? Uh, pester people mainly. <laughs> um, and that's what I did to get into props. I just kept pestering the props man where I was working um, until he let me make something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just just keep. Yeah, just keep asking. If you're keen enough and you're good enough, you'll 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 do well. Yeah. Awesome. That seems to be the way it's, it's the way it kind of goes with this yeah. sort of the creative arts industry, right? It's sort yeah. of the way yeah, it is. Just ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd say as well, like just constantly. I mean, you're all doing a degree, um, which is brilliant, and it's you know this is a a film production degree. But there's other stuff you can do if you know that you want to specialise. Maybe you've been looking at production design, but it's particularly props that you're interested in. You're like, do you know what? I think I would actually just like to make stuff all the time um, for these productions. Um, but, you know, we're not teaching you on the course how to make things, <laughs> you know, that like in, in terms of those. So there's that bit of self-sufficiency. Obviously, we have the maker spaces, which Abby mentioned before about how... Um, Oh, I love it. You know, we've got loads of stuff in there from 3D printing yeah. to, you know, the sewing machines. And we've got the small one at Media City, the bigger ones over at New Adelphi campus that students yeah. are able to go and use and use other resources. The 3D printing things, phenomenal. You know, you can design and print so many props um, for your films and stand back and paint and things. But it's developing those skills like um, practice makes perfect, I suppose. So if you want to get 
good at something you need to learn the techniques you need to learn how to do that and there's short courses and stuff you can do as well so if you're ever sort of going well no one's letting me in you know you can always ask yourself what could I be doing to upskill myself what could I be doing to practice this so when you do get the opportunity like Leo did to make that prop you do a good job of it and you're showing the best side of yourself and your skills you know um so sort of getting your work out there for people to see I suppose and developing your own practice all the time yeah definitely good I think it, it would be like you both say it, like you need to ask and if you get no's I mean you already have the no when you ask like what's worse like the, the worst that can happen is people telling you no and you already have a no so just like keep active just like keep doing stuff if you don't feel like using uh the like the quarantine to make stuff because you literally can't deal with that at the moment don't worry you don't stress yourself about it right? start like just drawing things like small things and measuring things oh my god learn how to take measurements that is so important <laughs> please do that please like Scale. yeah yeah you have no idea of the problems that cause like not taking the measurements right it's just not nice uh so <laughs> do that and just like keep making stuff like like Jane said and uh, keep drawing a lot uh, people say it's not necessary to know how to draw to be a production designer uh, I'm not a great drawer myself but I would strongly encourage you to take like at least like one tutorial in YouTube because it actually helps a lot you know like if you can use Photoshop go ahead but drawing is like always like I, I would say my primary tool to like explain what's in my mind because sometimes you you just need to take like a sheet of paper and like just draw something while you're talking to the director and like that would be the like the best way to uh, understand people and um, that and always say yes always say yes uh, when I started <laughs> working at Barrow uh, we were working at the Matt Hatter's tea party uh scenography for like an event and uh they was they were like oh do you know how to paint and <laughs> and my head was like say no say no you don't want to pop that up you don't want to do that and i was like yeah mm -hmm. yeah great at painting mm -hmm. and then they were like do you know how to use a jigsaw i was like i took one when i was 10 and that was it yes yes great a jigsaw mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were like the next question was do you want to like step into a ladder really really high and use the um the nail gun to like fix something that i was like yes yes let's do that <laughs> <laughs> and i just loved it i just loved it but i'm just like that you know, like obviously, like no, your cap only your capacities. If you are not capable of just like stepping into a ladder and use a nail gun, don't do that. But uh, <laughs> if you know that you can learn to do that, like that's going to open doors for you. Like you learn so much just by saying, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Or like, you know, just like get yourself into it. Just like do stuff. That's that's the best way you can get places. What I might add to that. Just as a suggestion, <laughs> if someone says, can you use a chair? <laughs> um, perhaps if you haven't used one, <laughs> maybe say no, yeah, no. on that occasion. <laughs> I'm ready to learn. How's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, like I've, I've had already used the jigsaw. Like it's, it wasn't oh. that bad. Uh, I, I'm quite a handy person. Uh, I like just building stuff. But yeah, yeah. If you if, if people say, do you want to use this jigsaw and you don't know how to yet, yeah, just don't say yes. Just, yeah, you think like it might be yeah. healthy. first. There. <laughs> possibly no. It reminded me. Um, there was an interview with them, a production designer, and she was saying that she's very she's a production designer so very much interpreting the narrative and how that's going to look on screen and how it's going to follow these characters and you know, thinking about key themes in films and um, but when she was trying to break into the industry because she had quite a few credits and they were just general art department credits she said she took a role as a props master 
thinking that she'd just get there and she'd manage all the people making the props and then when she got there and they're like we need you to make this so she was fired within a fortnight because she couldn't (laughs) actually make the prop she she could draw them and she knew what she wanted (laughs) but she couldn't physically make them and part of that role so I think her advice was you know make sure you really know what's expected of you in that job when like you take it you know oh yeah Um, yeah and she's a successful production designer now she's found where she sits within the art department and where her (laughs) role is but I concur with what you're saying there in terms of you know getting those runner positions getting those roles where they're offering you the opportunity to do different stuff and so help you figure out where you fit and where you want to be and you know where your skills sort of lie really um, and help navigate you through that department I suppose really and find yeah. Then yeah. I think uh, it would be like be honest with yourself and with others. You know, like if you know your skill set is not jigsawing, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't do it. <laughs> if you know your skill is not drawing, but you can like actually use the jigsaw really well, just say, you know what, I can use the jigsaw, and that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah, like you're not going to draw it. Well, if anyone's interested in learning sort of basic skills, I just go to the makerspace. You can have a yeah. tutorial. They'll show you how to use some of these pieces. With all the safety. So you can, you can learn to use them <laughs> yeah. safely, you know, yeah. practice, you know, <laughs> like make sure you... Set up a ladder, get, yeah. get done, set up a ladder, fire nails in at height. It's yeah. Great. yeah. <laughs> You're working at height safety training, you know. Yeah. <laughs> all of those no. things. Okay, this, it, it made it it sound really bad but I actually was introduced into safety matters okay like it wasn't just that like, I just climbed up but, like it's not it doesn't work like that sorry uh but yeah safety is like a big issue uh I would say in production design not only like in small uh productions because right production design students right now are not building sets like let's be honest they are just like bringing plants to set and like buying food for people and like going for coffee because like in a small production if you don't know what set design is you have nothing to do you know like in the whole production if you actually like are working a lot in your production design skills then you will be worried that there is like like maybe the guitar is not placed correctly you know and there's like a bat line in there and like you know, you will be crazy about that, in a, like, if you know what you're doing. But uh, safety is also, like, something they don't, uh, or we don't actually, like, think about much. Um, so when you're, like, designing your set, you actually need to take into account that you're going to have, like, the, the camera and, like, people moving moving around. And, like, nothing is going to fall if it's, like, like not, like, sticked to the wall or something because it could be, like, a safety issue or, like, you don't have paper, like close to the lamps because it can get like really hot and I imagine like in theater you also have like if props need to move or like if you have uh I saw you made like a uh, a set that kind of elevated and then rotated um and it had like a flying chair and stuff like you, like that, that's safety issues yeah. like it's, also- it, it's something not to take lightly there's all sorts you have to when you're flying actors uh or if they if they're on scenery that's moving or up in the air, there's all sorts of regulations that have to be yeah. met. Uh, otherwise, you just don't do it. Um, <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's it. Has there become more demand, Neil, over, I'm just thinking like, you know, trying to attract audiences into theatres and we're seeing like these great big set pieces and pyrotechnics and <laughs> water cannons and all sorts of stuff. Is a bit in the same way in film, we're getting more and more visual effects, like this demand for 3D and kind of like to get people. Is, the, is that happening in theatre? Is there a bit of, you know, in terms of design? I don't really think so, no. I think it's more some it totally depends on the production uh some productions like i'm thinking back to uh hamlet for instance with maxine peak um there was barely a set there i mean it was it was designed by amanda studley it was very nice it was uh but simple and paired back um and sometimes that's enough uh whereas other productions um usually like a musical will demand lots of scene changes and lots of 
you know, sort of action, shall we say, where you need things to 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 just change the scene or to enable a scene. And that's those are the productions where you tend to go big, shall we say. Um, and plus the budget is, you know, allowed for that. Um, whereas on some shows, your budget might not stretch, so you, you will pare back the set a little bit. Um, but we do pride ourselves on having uh, always an, a nice looking uh, stage to for them to act in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, can I just um? So we've got a couple of Instagram questions that I just wanted to run through. Uh, one, a couple of them we've already sort of answered. Uh, one of them was best way to source affordable props. Uh, free cycle. All those free cycling websites are awesome. Uh, Facebook Marketplace when you can see things for free. Mm-hmm. Ask your friends as well because that's one thing I did. Uh, it was very um. It was that was good. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, how can you get your foot in the door? <laughs> Talked about that. Uh, and there's one here which is what do you think filmmakers can learn from theatre productions? Neil? What do I think filmmakers learn from theatre productions? Um, I don't really know. Um, I mean there's a lot of theatre productions being filmed at the moment and and that was starting before um, before the lockdown and what the situation we're in. Um, and I mean, I keep going back to the, the Hamlet production, but that was filmed at our place at the Royal Exchange. And I felt that that was like watching a film. I don't know if you saw it. It was shown at the cinema, um, well, countrywide actually in the end, but um, it was like not watching a play, whereas some I've seen from the National and other places, um, it's like watching a play a film of a play, if you know what I mean. So I think there's more scope in that, uh, if if you get me. Um, I don't know what I mean, really, but uh, <laughs> I, I know. The Exchange is a really good theatre for that, actually, because you've got a lot of different angles that you can yeah, come yeah, it, from. You can move the camera. You're not stuck yeah. to that almost TV set, three camera set up, like vision. You can move the cameras around. The exchange has got a lovely sort of setup for actually filming the performance, I'd say. That's yeah, it was like watching a film of it and, and the play, and they were sort of definitely separate, whereas I would say that, yeah, it was more immersive. Um, but, yeah, like you say, it, the, the exchange could do a lot more of that, I think, um, combining it with film. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's vice versa. Uh, yeah, there's definitely like a way forward with that. I think something they've got for me that stands up has really been in common is terms of in terms of sort of supporting the performance because when we come back to telling that story, it's all about the performance of the actors and the mm. characters and even things like props actually become really important. The stuff they're interacting with on stage, it's it's the same in film. Like you've got to make sure that, I mean, we talk about costume as well, but in particular with props, like the chairs that they're sitting on or the things that they're picking up and they're interacting with, it has to have some help the actor in their performance, so to speak. Does that make yeah. sense? It has to aid that and whether that's, theatre or film that's always consistent that supporting of the performance of the actors within that scene and is always going to be the same and I think taking that across the two sort of like you don't forget that in film just because you know we're watching it on a screen doesn't mean that the performer (laughs) you know doesn't need to like doesn't need to feel real in in that moment um I think yeah that's drifting off now in my own little yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> you know those I'm thinking of find uh, what you're saying then really interesting about film and theatre and in terms of sort of becoming a little bit more involved with one another um and sort of mixing the mediums a little bit a yeah little bit more yeah I think it kind of works yeah. sometimes and it if you make that effort to make it into a different thing i think it i think it enhances it or change it changes it so it's it's a different thing altogether you're not just like going through the motions 
So get going, you filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> so we've probably got time yeah. for like a couple more questions, by the way, guys, um, if anyone wants to pitch in. But I do have one, which is, I don't know, with all of you, like what's the best way to analyze a script for getting those props in and understanding how the production design and stuff like what's your sort of process read it just read it a couple <laughs> times um, a couple of loads of times um yeah just get to know the story behind it for well i guess it works different for uh for different people like some people have like a lot of work uh, with director uh i like researching a lot uh, and like having like this close relationship with the director and the producer uh, and the DOP because it just helps me see what they're going to see or like what they have in their heads because um, obviously you do need to like convince the audience that this is like a natural world you know whatever the world that you're building is like if it's Star Wars or if it's Avatar which is like an amazing film or it's just like a room with a chair you know or like a really realistic set you need to convince not only the people who's watching the film but like the actors that the scene like everything is like real so they can feel comfortable and you also need to help the director uh follow the narrative i i, I feel like if you have something inside that was not like helping the narrative like just don't put it there don't don't do that uh and like, like helping the dop also to like get that flowing in in his work and like the camera and like working with light uh as a production designer is something that you need to like take in consideration as well uh i think um if i was looking at scripts and that script breakdown i think there's a couple of different i suppose it depends what angle you're coming at that script from so you've got the idea of breaking it down into just what's needed like, so what props are there? Where are we? You know, is there a table? Is there a chair? What do we need, like, physically? And then there's the storytelling aspect of it as well. So I say you're always reading a script multiple times, but for different purposes, possibly. Yeah. So you've got your very logistical <laughs> way of writing the script where you have to pull out everything that's needed within that scene because it has to go into a budget it has to be accounted for if it's specifically spoken about in the script like a character picks something up or sits down on something you have to have that thing potentially because yeah. otherwise it could change but then like we were saying earlier you've got about the social and political context to the film and the character context and that visual communication so you know what type of chair is it what type of table is it and moving beyond maybe even just era and location, you're starting to talk about, you know, social economic sort of status of that character. You know, how old is this piece of furniture? There's a tendency sometimes, I think, in, in film as well with era stuff and particularly short film. You know, when you said it in like the 80s or the 90s, that everything you see in that room is from the 1980s. Um, but actually, you know, that's not how life is like if you look at someone's house and they've lived in that house for 20 to 30 years it's not all you know we might be in the 80s but all their furniture is not going to be from the 80s you know we've all got pieces of furniture and even technology that is there from the 1970s or the 1960s or more contemporarily i'm sure even you have stuff from the 90s or early noughties and we're now in 2020 you know not everything's cutting edge it says something about that character that selection and also the um, distressing of something. So I will make one little point. When you're breaking down scripts, you have to think about the purpose of that scene and what's being communicated in the character's situation. So what I see quite often in short film was we'll get the era right in terms of costuming maybe, or even a prop, um, but we maybe don't get the distressing of that item right. So if it's war and they've been in the trenches for three days why are they wearing an immaculate uniform? Why is yeah. it not ripped and torn and dirty? And and it's because, well, I've managed to borrow it from this costume house and I don't want to make it dirty. Well, you're going to have to rethink that because you're breaking, you know, <laughs> that kind of like belief that I have at the moment when I'm watching it. And linking back to that performer, if they're worrying about damaging this prop or they're worrying about getting their costume dirty or the things they're not allowed to do, 
it's not going to aid their performance in any way. So when we're looking at the script, you know, for me, there's three or four different angles that I'd be looking at it from um, mm -hmm. and things that need to be considered like logistics, narrative and visual communication, I suppose. I don't really uh, get involved too much in going through with a fine tooth comb because the designer tends to do that and relay that to me. Uh, but things are always changing. I'm sure they are in film as well. But uh, if it's a new play, for instance, there might be something come in. The change, you know, if it's an adaptation, they'll change certain scenes, certain uh, parts of the script so it's always changing right up until the last minute like the last show we did before um before we were shut down um was rockets and blue lights it was on uh, radio three actually there's a radio play they did it i don't know if you caught it but it was, it was good but we never really got to see that um unfortunately the set's still there i think <laughs> <laughs> um uh, but that was always changing right up until the last minute. Um, so, yeah, I, d I don't get involved too much in, in reading the script personally. Um, How much direction do you get, Neil, just out of interest? Like if someone sort of made those decisions, are they very specific with you or do they tend to leave it up to you a bit? Um, so those props? It depends how well they know me. <laughs> <laughs> some, some will be uh yeah if i've worked with someone many times they'll, they'll kind of instill a bit of trust um whereas if they don't know me or the department they might be a bit more sort of watching what's going on um but uh yeah i think it varies again it's mm -hmm. so you know i quite like it having some sort of design input to certain things i might advise the designer <clears throat> on certain things and and particularly for the royal exchange if they come with a big i don't know a big box they're going to put in the middle of the stage we might say um hmm, don't think that's going to be very good for sight lines <laughs> so we because we know the space quite well between us we might advise in that way and also you know they might ask us certain designers will say what do you think and i'll say well that's all right or i might say no i don't like it <laughs> 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 yeah. Depends how well I know them, um, but yeah. Yeah, well, you need to like work in like collaboration with the designer and the and the prop maker or like the construction uh, like person that is like helping you. Like you cannot just go ahead and say I want this and this is what I get. Like that's not it's not going to that's not going to work. Uh, you need to take in consideration people who actually know what they're doing. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, it's just like in set, everything changes. It's not always like what you imagined. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't know, Jane, if you remember that, uh, you put also an example of like a big table, I think. Like if you want a big, like marvelous table from the like 15th century or something like that. And like in, in, a, in a house, and it's like all oak and it's amazing, but it doesn't contribute to the scene or like, it's just not going to fit. And you don't want to listen to your uh, prop master or to your like location uh, agent or like your decorator and they say, no, it's not going to happen. And you just don't want to hear like that, to listen, like that's not going to happen. Like you need to actually like be in constant communication to know what's going to work and what isn't because you can ruin your film just like by not listening to people who know what they're doing exactly yeah but by the same token if you've got an idea and they don't agree with it if you think it's a good idea you must pursue it because you know i don't want to be sort of it's all about personal taste yeah really, and uh what you think looks good so don't give up your ideas is what i'm saying no i don't know but like find a way around it <laughs> if it's a budget consideration like yeah, yeah using yeah. the example of like a 15th century massive oak table and you're going no <laughs> it must be authentic because I, I must have a real antique table from the 15th century yeah. and your props master saying we well, don't really we could make one and make yeah. it look like a yeah. and it will cost us 25 percent of the cost of the yeah. real yeah. 
thing then you know thing. listen to those people that have the solution to your design exactly. problem. don't say so fixed on there's only one way to do it i think yeah there's more than one way I think to one particular occasion when i was asked i was given a postcard from the bronte parsonage and there was a sofa on it and uh, and that was the only sofa that would do in the world so i had to recreate that sofa <laughs> Yeah, so that, sometimes yeah, exactly. you have to go down that road, uh, and uh, yeah. I think you've got to have a really clear vision as a designer as to what you want and be very clear in and understanding. And I think for me, it's always coming back to the story and what you said earlier was quite key about, you know, collaborating as well as a in film anyway, as a production designer with the DOP, with the director. Because yeah. fundamentally, we always go back to the director and their kind of, vision oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. for the piece um, and we kind of have to be working within that but as long as I think everybody on the production needs to understand the story to some degree and what the final vision is that we're all trying to work towards and create as long as you can help your team understand that everyone's going to mm -hmm. be working towards that same end goal mm -hmm. you know I think you'll run into problems when you can't communicate that vision maybe and you're really unclear as a designer <laughs> as to what the actual design is I'm not sure I just need the thing but I'm not sure how it's going to be coherent and I mm -hmm. think that's where the difference between just marking up a script for items and marking up a script for context differs and that's where your designer really comes in how do they make that world coherent how do they make it work together and um, mm -hmm. how do we communicate this story um, and then go to your experts to help fabricate those things, find yeah. the best way to make it to the best quality and the and the highest standard that we can for our budget, <laughs> you know, and for our, you know, <laughs> what's the best way to go about this? Like you're saying about the sofa, we can't buy the original, so how are we going to recreate it? How are we going to do that, you know, um, and listening to those people? Yeah, awesome. Uh, we are about at the hour point. Is there anything else that anyone wants to ask anyone or say anything before we finish as a, like a nice little thing, a nice little rounding comment? I just had one question for Neil, like just linking because you made me think with the film thing earlier, <laughs> like linking film and theatre a bit more. Um, and this idea of immersive environments and kind of I went to the Da Vinci exhibit in London um, a few months ago um, and it was this you walk into the room and they've used pre-shot um, video so they then put up a screen that they've put set pieces in so it looks like a window but behind it, it's got a scene so that like the rain's coming down on the window and like they were trying to create these atmospheres. Do you think as well, is that an area that film and theatre can come together a little bit, this recording of external stuff to bring it in? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, personally, if I'm making a prop for a film or an installation or whatever, I make it in the same way. So there's no, you know, difference to me. <laughs> it has the same quality. Yeah for the reasons I explained earlier because you can be as close as this to the to the props um, it has to be finished in a, in a, in a in the way I'm used to <laughs> yeah. yeah I agree like in film if you cut corners uh, and then the director decides that he wants to t change the shot so now your prop or your furniture is going to be like in a super close up. Oh, you, yeah. you need you need to like make just things right, <laughs> like as much as possible. If you run out of time and money and like you can cut corners and you have to like go for it. But I wouldn't recommend it either. It's just uh, just in yeah. A, in film, if you're talking like, you know, big budget film, it goes right down to in costume where you um, you have to uh, get the right stitch in for like a medieval costume and that kind of oh, thing. Yeah. When it's you know it's there on somebody's chest and you're seeing it um, mm -hmm. and props, you know you can spend. I'm thinking of Warhorse in particular, the 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 sort of sort of cut off. That was amazing. That horse's head. I mean that guy was yeah. But he. Yeah perhaps, you know, six months to a year or something developing that, I guess. Um, unfortunately, we don't 
have that luxury. <laughs> around times a lot, a lot faster. Yeah. I think 4K is like it, HD was bad enough, and then you know bringing 4K in, shooting stuff, you know every detail. <laughs> is yeah. Like yeah. Um, it's no it needs to be the real thing screen. now. <laughs> yeah, big screen and 4K, and now in 3D as well. So it's like, oh great. So like, <laughs> you know, yeah. all of these different challenges when it comes to making those props, but. Oh, yeah. um, yeah, so I'd sort of say whether you're students or not, testing and test shoots are just so important in the same way that a rehearsal with props in a the theatre, I'm sure, is imperative. Like you would, I would love what you said about the crunch and about that prop you were creating earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, and making those work, you know, the, the actors will use those in rehearsals and it will be made sure that everything's working and that if anything needs tweaking and changing that that sort of happens yeah, um, yeah. and in in film we need to do the same thing you need to shoot those elements and make sure they look good on screen whether it's you as a designer or prop maker photographing them to see mm -hmm. what they're looking like or actually getting the cameras that you'll be shooting on and the codex right and the lighting yeah. right and making sure that it that it works before you get to shoot day also, sometimes you don't know if it's going to work or not until you've got the thing. So quite often yeah. we'll make things and uh, yeah, they'll end up not being used at all. And, you know, some quite elaborate things sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just part of the course, really. It's how you learn, isn't it? I think. Try and avoid that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's happened. But it's how you learn, isn't it? And it's how mm -hmm. you sort of build that skill set further. You sort of, well, no, that doesn't work now. It didn't work for this, but it could yeah. work for something else in the future. Yeah. You know? yeah, you need to try stuff to know what <laughs> what's going on. If you don't try it, you, you'll never know. Yeah, well, that that tends to be the, the director's decision at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, the designer might, with best will in the world, get us to make something that he believes or she believes is is perfect and then it'll get to the scene and oh no <laughs> we don't need that <laughs> so yeah awesome um yeah yeah anyone else anything or is that that everyone about happy good okay awesome. yeah so it's that time and we're coming to a wrap up does everyone want to recommend me a little cheeky film for people to watch while they're in quarantine remember related to production design you get some extra podcast points not that they do anything yet but you know yeah <laughs> if you can make it relevant <laughs> give us a give us a film for people to watch or a tv show or anything whatever you uh, i've got one for you king of staten island have you watched it oh i've seen uh trailers and stuff but i'm not actually yeah seen it, so. yeah i enjoyed it it's good yeah quite upbeat although it doesn't appear to be at the at the start Mm, that's what I got from the trailer. I thought it was quite a sad one. Oh, okay, awesome. Nice. Go on, Abby. What do you... <laughs> oh, okay. I'll let you go. I, I, I don't know. I don't know which one you were going to recommend because we said that film, but uh... you, you go with the one that you that you want. Are you to sure? Go with a different one. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. I don't know. It's because uh, we were talking earlier about Anna Karenina, which has like a theatrical production involved and it's just like so amazing the way everything is built and like the costume oh my god the costume design is absolutely amazing like I'm speechless when I watched it I was so in love with that film I just want to do something like that one day uh yeah if you can watch it like it would be amazing uh there's uh, also V for Vendetta which is like I love that film and it has such an interesting like production design if you haven't watched it you need to watch it oh my god so good right sorry <laughs> you go now and um, i'm actually going to go with um the film pride um just because it might not be one that's immediately obvious in terms of production design but in terms of the way that they communicate social and political context within the mise-en-scene and within the set dressing and all of those elements it just works so well and um, go back to what I was saying earlier about different eras and sort of representing characters and their journey just through the furniture that they have in their flats or their houses and um, it works so well and it's done really beautifully in a very sort of naturalistic way and um, but it's clearly very well thought out 
um, throughout it, you get a really good sense of the characters, but also their political and social ideologies and contexts as well, and um, without anyone ever needing to actually tell you what those are. Um, so I think in terms of thinking of design and expanding character, it's a really good film to watch for that um, and pick up on those details. Awesome, nice. I um, We had one from Jules who's sat in the chat. She says that we she, she recommends the Grand Budapest Hotel. Obviously, mm. it's very nice, very well designed, beautiful sets. Um, and I w will recommend the animation Coraline, uh, which obviously they made loads of different Coralines for different parts of the filming, which was very interesting. And I think the uh, whole and the animation is just beautiful in that film anyway. So thank you very much for listening this week, guys, with production design. Uh, if you want to see more of our stuff that we do, uh, you're at UOS underscore film production on Instagram. You can check out Anchor FM, Apple Music, Spotify, uh, YouTube, all the normal places where you get podcasts. Uh, they are everywhere they're literally all over the place they're coming out of the goddamn walls go watch go listen go do whatever you need to do uh but make sure you keep making film guys and keep producing designing yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> thank you very much guys thank you neil thank you abby thank you Welcome. jane great thank having you, you. Um, yeah bye everyone bye, bye, -bye.